We got about 200 meters outside the base and got pinned down for five days. Um, not totally pinned down, but we were just we could get back to where we were. I mean, we were just trying to get back to pick up some of our wounded and dead, and uh, of course the wounded were killed by then too. But um, the we got pinned down out in, a, in an open. Um, they were up in a hedgerow a little ahead of us uh, in a tree line, and they were in dug in in holes and they were firing at us when we were, waited till they we got right on top of them. So uh, we didn't have anywhere to go. Um, my company commander turns to me and says, uh, "Ross, call in a call in an airstrike on that hedgerow." And <laughs> I'm going, "Well, it's right there," but um, they. I, the spotter pilots were in, sh in uh, Cess twin engine Cessnas, uh, propping the front and the back with the wings and by wings. And they so I called in. Uh, his his call sign was Barky One Three. Uh, our radio uh, was Shallow Torch Six. Was the company commander was Six One Six. Was the first platoon. Second platoon was Two Six. You know those were all the officers. So I was Shallow Torch Six Romeo. I was the uh, Commander's radio operator. So I called in, uh, told him we wanted an airstrike on on a hedgerow, and gave him the coordinates. And he came flying in. He's, and he looked at the situation. He says, "Are you talking about his this hedgerow here?" And he scraped with his machine gun fire. And as he did, they ducked down, and we kind of tried to slide back a little bit. And he says, "It's too close for an airstrike." And I tried to tell him I'd come to Commander Captain Smallwood, and he says, "No." He says, "We need an airstrike on that." So. He'd been there with special forces, I assumed he knew what he was doing. <laughs> so um, he went by and scraped it a couple more times and we slid back a little bit further each time. Uh, the two jet fighters showed up and they came by and scraped it a couple times with machine gun fire. So each time we kept getting a little further away, um, they'd still pop up and start firing at you again while they, while they came around. But when they finally did come around for that, to drop the napon, it just, I mean, it just comes tumbling out of the plane and it just, when it hits, it just, it's just a ball of fire. I mean, we got up and we're running and you could just feel the heat on your back and, the, and it practically sucks the oxygen, oxygen out of the air. It was just, I mean, it's incredible. And it seemed like before the smoke even cleared away, they were firing out of those holes again. It was, uh, <laughs> uh, it gives you a, a feeling of, you know, geez, you know, what do we have to do here? Um, but um, we dragged a lot of the wounded off to the side. We were calling in medevacs. Uh, one tanker lost its whole bottom jaw, and the, hel the medevac wasn't going to land at first. And I, you know, I'm talking to him on the radio, and I, I, you got to get down here. So eventually, he did come down. I, I got him on the helicopter. Um, you know, we we tried a couple of different things. We we pulled back, and we tried to come around from a little bit different angle. We came to a ravine where the where the tanks couldn't cross. So, company commander and a, uh, an artillery liaison officer and the two radio operators, Turner and I, we went. We're walking down through the through the gorge, looking for a place for them to cross. And um, all of a sudden, we hear the M16s and AK-47s firing from back and forth across the ravine. And we thought, well, this probably isn't some place we should be. The, um, there's a difference distinct difference between the sound of an AK-47 firing and an M-16 firing, you, you learn it right away. You know, you hear about the M-16s uh, jamming every once in a while, and so guys would say, well, they'll pick up an AK-47, you know, and all of a sudden they start firing that AK-47, and everybody's turning and firing at them, so, you know, they get rid of it in a hurry. But, um, so we, we turned around, went back up to where we climbed back out of the ravine, and all of a sudden the commander realizes he didn't have his map, and I says, well, I'll go get it. You just, you do dumb things. You're, so I went back by myself and got the maps, found where they were, took them back up. But it took us, uh, it took us several days of en encountering them from different angles and everything else before we finally managed to push them back out of the area enough that we could get back to where we picked up uh, all the initial dead that we, we'd had in the beginning, which it, it was quite a bit. I mean, um, it, uh, you realize, you know, but, uh, how easy it is, you know, it's to to get shot or something. But it, was, it went to, once we got back in, there, you know, the uh, the guys that were there were some guys that just all of a sudden started shooting themselves in the foot or something to go home. It was uh, 
you know, it was pretty horrific, everything that you see. Um, my company commander had been there with Special Forces for a year, two years before that. He said we saw more action the first three months we were there than he saw the whole year with Special Forces. So um, we were definitely in the heat of it, uh, right, up, right up along the DMZ at the time.